Thank you. So today we're here to talk about change, and we've heard lots of examples of really good change, and some examples of change that are less good. Now, of course, what we want to do is when we see change happening is that we want to be able to control it. And often, we don't really know how to do that. So I'd like to give you three examples of systems that are currently changing, where we would like to be able to control that change. <laughs> that is not what I expected it to be. So who, whose talk is this? Ah, there we are. Cool. OK. Um, so this is my first example of change that is currently happening. Um, there are about 36 million people globally that are suffering from Alzheimer's disease. And the World Health Organization predicts a tripling of this number until the year 2050. The second example is the world's honeybee population. It's decreasing by about 20% each year. And the economic value of natural pollination is estimated to be $265 billion. And that is not even to mention the ecological value of natural pollination. The third example is the financial crisis that happened in 2008 that cost us, over the course of three years, 2.6 trillion US dollars. Now, what do brains, bees, and bankers have in common? These are all complex systems. And complex systems usually are very robust. You know, your head can tolerate being hit by a football, and it's fine. A beehive can tolerate a harsh winter, and it doesn't matter too much. And the economy can tolerate booms and busts. That's, that's part of it. So what is it that makes complex systems that usually are very robust fail so spectacularly when they do fail? That's what I wanted to know. So I got interested in complex systems when I did my PhD in physics. And I was thinking of what to do next, what to do with my career. And at that point, I remembered a book that I had received many years before. It was a book about complex systems. And it talked about a place in Santa Fe in the United States where physicists studied complex systems. Brains, bees, bankers. And that to me seemed, that seemed like an invitation to, to go there and understand how things work. How does the world work? So I decided to go to Santa Fe and do a postdoc in complex systems. And um, a few years later, I joined the faculty of the School of Mathematics in Bristol. And I was approached by a colleague, a philosopher of science, James Ladyman. And he asked me the question, so what is a complex system? And I realized that in all these years of studying complex systems, I had not come across a satisfying answer to that question. So James and I decided we would try to find an answer. Now, the first thing that we noticed about all these systems that I've just shown you is that they consist of many elements that are interacting and forming an emergent behavior. So what do I mean by that? Take the human brain. The human brain consists of about 100 billion neurons. Now, that is many elements. They're interacting, and they're forming thoughts and feelings and language. That is the emergent behavior. A healthy human brain loses about 9,000 neurons each day, and we don't even notice it. So it's a very robust piece of matter that generates emergent behavior. What about a beehive? A healthy honey beehive consists of between 20 and 70,000 bees. Now, these bees are interacting, they're talking to each other, they're foraging, they're building nest sites. That is the emergent behavior of a beehive. If I were to take out a few hundred of these workers of the beehive, the beehive would simply continue to function because other bees are taking over the tasks of the bees that I just took out. And in a healthy hive, you can even take out the queen, and the hive will simply breed a new queen. So complex systems are consisting of these many elements that very robustly give you an emergent behavior. Now, this begs the question, is that enough? If I have something that consists of many elements, 
that forms an emergent behavior, is that enough for it to be a complex system? So let's look at a watch, a mechanical watch. We've all seen it. And there are many elements inside. It's the cogs and wheels inside that are interacting and then are forming an emergent behavior, which is a watch tells time, while an individual element inside of the watch does not tell time. But if I were to take out just a single wheel out of that watch, the watch would immediately stop working. So it is not as robust as the other systems we looked at. So a watch is not a complex system. Now, the second thing we noticed about all of these systems is that they all consist, they all contain order as well as disorder inside of them at the same time. And what do I mean by that? If <coughs> we take a honeybee hive, now looking at an infrared image of a honeybee hive, what we see is that at the core of the hive, the temperature is at a constant 34 degrees Celsius. And this temperature is only ever deviating by max 2 degrees Celsius. So it's an incredibly robust feature of a hive. And um, um, so this constant feature inside of the hive is what I call order. What is disorder in a hive? Well, we all know because we've looked at it and it looks incredibly disordered when you look at a hive. So at some level, we have a disordered behavior, and at another level, we have a very ordered behavior. Now, how do the bees manage to regulate the temperature to this precise degree? In order to understand that, we need to understand what bees do in order to regulate the temperature. What do they do? A single bee senses the temperature around itself, and if it seems not warm enough, it starts flapping its wings and it starts moving about a bit. And then it sees if that goes in the right direction. And if it's warm enough, it will stop. And all the other bees are doing the same thing. But the thing is, they don't do that in a, in a very regular way. They try something out. And if it works, they keep doing it. If it doesn't work, they do something else. So we have a disordered behavior at the bottom level of this complex system. And this disordered behavior through interaction leads to a very ordered state at this higher level. So we have a disordered behavior that through interaction leads to an ordered state. That is a hallmark of a complex system. Now what does that mean for complex systems to fail? If these are very robust systems, what does it take for a complex system to fail? So if we think of the brain again, a human brain loses about 9,000 neurons a day in a healthy state. But a human brain that suffers from Alzheimer's disease loses about half of its neurons. Now that is billions. So somewhere in between, it crosses the line from being healthy to being unhealthy. Um, what about order and disorder? What is order in the brain? Order in the brain is neurons firing in a synchronous way. When neurons do that, that is, that is basically a thought, that is a feeling, synchronous firing of neurons. But when there are too many neurons firing at the same time, there is too much order, then that can lead to an epileptic seizure. And that is an unhealthy state of the brain. So somewhere there is a good balance between order and disorder for a complex system to function well. In order for us to know, you know how many is many and how much order and disorder is good, what we need is mathematical tools. And there is a particular mathematical method that I got very interested in. And it's inside something that you probably all have in your pockets. We heard about it before. It's your mobile phone. Your mobile phone is based on the mathematics of information. Now, the mathematics of information was invented in the 1940s. So what was the situation in the 1940s? There was Churchill sitting in London, needing to talk to Roosevelt in Washington. <coughs> and all that had to go was a very noisy phone line that went from London through the Atlantic Ocean to Washington. 
Now, this very noisy phone line made the American engineer, Clark Shannon, wonder about how noisy can this phone line be for these two people to still be able to communicate reliably. And so Clark Shannon pretty much single-handedly invented the mathematics of information and communication. And in particular, he invented a mathematical function, which he called the entropy function. And this function is designed to measure disorder, noise, in communication. And all the algorithms inside of your phone are all based on this function. So they make sure that when you talk into your phone, your voice gets through fine at the other end. So this function is perfectly designed to measure order and disorder. Now, the cool thing about this function is that you can measure order and disorder in speech, or you can measure order and disorder in neural firing patterns, in animal movements, stock market prices. This is what we can do, what we can take, to characterize complex systems. So how does that work in practice? A few years ago, a colleague of mine, Paddy Royal, and I, we looked at glassy materials. A glassy material, a glass, we all know that when you heat up a glass, it starts to become liquid. You can bring it into shape, and you cool it down again, and it will retain its shape. The puzzling thing was, for decades, for scientists, the following. You take the liquid glass and the solid glass, and you bring them under the microscope, and you look at them, and you will not be able to tell the difference. They both look equally disordered. But clearly, there's a huge difference between them. One you can take and drink wine out of, and the other one you can't. So Paddy and I designed a mathematical tool based on the entropy function that we then applied to videos of these two materials under the microscope. And we were able to distinguish the solid form of the glass from the liquid form by measuring the amount of order that it takes for the liquid to become solid. So there, we actually could find an answer to different behaviors of a complex system using information theory. Now, here's a very different example of a complex system where mathematical tools helped. You've probably all heard of the fatal incident that happened again this year in Mecca, where several hundred people were trampled to death during the pilgrimage. Now, this is not the first time this happened. And so, in 2007, the Saudi Arabian government asked complex system scientists at the ETH in Zurich to see if they could find a solution to this problem. So, what these scientists did was they took videos of these very crowded areas and they looked at the flow of people in these areas. And what they noticed is that most of the time the flow was pretty regular and people were going this way and people were going this way. But then about 20 minutes before the fatal accident, and that was at a particular region, the Jamarat Bridge region, 20 minutes before the incident, the flow of people started to change very much. And what they observed was that turbulence started to arise in the areas where later on people would be squashed. So what they suggested to the government was to put in flow-shaping objects into these areas. And that was implemented. And there hasn't been an accident in that area since. Now, this year's accident was in a different area. So clearly, there's more to be done. But there's something we have understood about complex systems and many elements interacting, and the right balance between order and disorder. So. What can we take away from that? If we wanted to be able to control change that is happening in these complex systems around us at the moment, I think we need four things to think about. The first one is we need to understand really well what a complex system is to begin with. And the second thing we need is mathematics. The third thing we need is a specialist knowledge of the system that we're looking at. And then last, but by no means least, I think we need to appreciate the power of disorder.